We're going to begin a new study this morning, and, and, and as I've been thinking about it this week, it's probably going to be kind of a hit and miss study, only because there are so many things going on this summer that uh, I'm going to start a study this morning. Next week, we may focus on Vacation Bible School and share some of our lessons, and then I may get to preach one more message in this study, and then we're going to have a team service, and then I may get another message into the study, so it's going to be hit and miss. But I think it's going to be a good study. It's one I've been thinking about for a long time and just haven't really taken the time to, to put together. Uh, what, what I want to think about uh, for a number of weeks anyway in this study is a the Christian and his work. I want to think about Christianity, what the Bible says about our work and, and how we do our work and our attitude at work and, and, and all of those things. Uh, and as I said, I've been thinking about it for, for a long time and just really haven't felt led to, to take that step and, and to dive into this study, and, and I think now is the time that, that we're going to do that. As I thought about our work, you know, what we do to earn a living, as I thought about our work, I thought, you know, our work probably affects our lives more than almost anything else that we do. Our work affects our lives more than almost anything else that, that we do. How many of you have ever said, oh, I can't do that, i got to work? So what does that say? Work is affecting your life. Okay? Work affects your life. And, and, and almost everything that we do revolves around our work. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it doesn't affect our lives. We plan everything around our work schedule. Well, I can't do that. I've got to work that day. Well, I can't be there then because I don't get out of work until... You know, it, it affects everything that we do. We schedule our meals around what? Our work day, right? We have breakfast, generally speaking. I realize not everybody does this exactly, but we have our breakfast before we go to work. We, we have a break, theoretically, at some point where we can have our lunch. And then we come home from work, and what do we do? What's for supper? Okay? We, 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 we plan our meals. We plan our vacations, times that we can get away. Our, our daily plans, our travel plans, our doctor's appointments, almost everything we plan around work because we have to. And, and so work affects our lives a tremendous deal. I was also thinking, and, and I, I guess this is probably true, theoretically we spend more time with our coworkers than we do our family members. Don't we? You know, we spend a, a great deal of time at work almost every day of the week. Uh, and, and so we, you know, we spend more time with those that we work with than we do our family members, just by default, by the nature of, of how we, we earn a living. Here are some, some statistics that I, I put together. I didn't put them together. I read them. But I got these statistics from uh, a website. It was called Business Insiders. It's their website. Get this statistic. The average American spends 90,000 hours of their lifetime at work. That's a lot of hours. That's a lot of hours. They also said that 25% of Americans say that work is the main source of stress in their lives. Now, I was surprised that was only 25%. I thought it might be more than that. But it, but it is stressful. 40% of Americans say that their work is very or extremely stressful. 64% of workers in the United States cancel their vacations every year, and a big chunk of those is because of work. And I thought, you know, how many of those that go on vacation every year take their work with them and access their work and think about their work while they are theoretically on vacation? And I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but, but I share all of those statistics to say that work affects our lives. And it affects our lives in, in a great deal, maybe even more than we think about. And I thought, you know, with those things in mind, it really is important for us to ask the question as Christians, what does the Bible say about my work? What does the Bible say about my work? What does the Bible say about how I do my work and my attitude at work and, and what work is and where work comes from? What does the Bible say about those things? As you can imagine... The Bible has a lot to say about those things. The Bible has a lot to say about those things. And I've said this many times, and I prayed it just a minute ago. But, you know, the Bible speaks to everything that we do in our lives. And, and, and the Bible, at least...
least gives us principles that apply to everything that we do in our lives. Whether it's our home life, our life at work, our life in the community, the Bible speaks to all of those things. And, and so we always need to be looking to see what the Word of God says in regards to, to those things. Over the next several weeks, I want to look at a number of topics, and, and this isn't a complete list of what I plan to look at yet, but in part, I, I want to look at the fact that our work matters to God. What we do in our lives matters to God. It's important to Him. We also want to look at the fact that our attitude, especially at work, affects our performance. Our attitude, how we look at our work and who our master is, who we serve when we go to work, makes a tremendous difference in how we do our work. We also want to think for a little bit about what does a Christian employee look like? What does he look like? What does she look like? What is a Christian employee? How, how, do you, how are you a Christian at work? We also want to think about the, the fact that uh, our, our work and through our work, we have a tremendous opportunity to impact the world that we live in. And we're going to think about a little bit about that this morning, but in much more detail later on. I do believe that one of the greatest opportunities that we have as Christians to affect our world is through our workplace. If we are truly spending 90,000 hours of our lives at work, where else are we going to affect our world more than that? Where else are we going to affect our world? Where else are we going to have a greater opportunity to, to shine as a, a Christian and to shine the light of Jesus Christ in the world than in our workplace? As I thought about all of that, I threw this question in here, so take it for what it's worth. But I thought of this. We have all of those opportunities and all of that time. How much Christian influence do we really see in our workplace? How much do we see? If we're not seeing much, why is that? If we as Christians are living for Christ, and Christ is living through our lives, why aren't we seeing a greater impact in our workplace? Other than our families, who knows us better? than the people that we rub shoulders with every day at work. Who knows us better than them? And, and if we are living for Christ, why aren't we influencing them? Why aren't we impacting them for Christ? And, and maybe we are. Maybe, maybe I've missed something. But what is our influence? What impact are we having uh, because of our Christian lives through our work? This morning I want to look at a variety of things, kind of just to get our study going this morning. And the things that I want to look at this morning revolve in a part at least around the idea that our work matters to God. What we do every day, what we do to earn a living, our work matters to God. And so I want to look at just a number of thoughts that go under that. First of all, what I want to think about is our work is something that God gave us. Our work is something that God gave us. You ever listen to people talk about work? What impression do you get about work as you listen to people talk about going to work? <laughs> Probably not a real high impression, is it? If we listen to people talk about going to work, you get the idea that work is one of the worst things that's ever happened to mankind. You ever get that impression? You ever give that? Don't raise your hand. You ever give that impression? We think, oh, i got to go to work. My day is ruined. It's Monday morning. And i got to go back to work. I think, you know, sometimes we get the idea and sometimes we give the impression that work is, is, is a curse. That work is an awful thing. We, we like to talk, at least it seems that way, we, we like to talk about how much we hate going to work. How much we wish we didn't need to go to work. Like, oh, man, this is the worst thing that ever happened. And we give that impression, and we get that impression. And yet it's interesting to me, we read Genesis 2 this morning, and I want you to turn back there for a few minutes. It's interesting to me, because if we understand what the Bible says, where does work come from? It comes from God. The ability to work, and the command to work, all of those things came from God. God created man to work. If we read in Genesis 1 and we read in Genesis 2, 
we see there that God created a perfect world. God created a perfect world. After each of the days, or almost all of the days of creation, God created and God made and God looked at it and God said, it is very good. My creation, God is saying, is exactly what I wanted it to be. Everything is in harmony. Everything is, it is working together. Now, if I was to ask you this morning, describe the perfect world, how would you describe it? Most of us would start with, there'd be no sickness, there'd be no death, there'd be none of those things. And that is true. That's the way it was when God created it in Genesis. But it wouldn't, I don't think, that we would go very long before somebody would say, we wouldn't have to work. We could just stay home and relax. And we wouldn't have to do any of those things. Somebody would say that. But it's interesting to me that when God created the perfect world, work was a part of it. Work was a part of what God created. Notice that even in the perfect world, God gave Adam and Eve work to do. If you look at verses 17 through 19. Make sure I got the right verses down here. I don't have the right verses. Start at verse 15. It says, The Lord God took man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to do what? To work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You shall eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're not going to eat of that because if you do, you're going to die. Now, it's interesting to me that God created for man everything he needed. The fruit trees. Everything man needed to live and to survive was put in the garden. And it's interesting to me that man was not told to just sit back and enjoy it. He was told, work for it. Toil for the ground. Work, labor, take care of what I have created. I was thinking about it this morning as I was reading the scripture. I thought, you know what? God provides for people, and God provided for the children of Israel how? Food just fell out of the sky. And they picked it up every day and they ate it. But in God's perfect creation, God didn't just let the food fall from the sky for Adam and Eve to eat. God put it in the garden. God grew it. God created it. But God said to Adam and Eve, now, you need to work for it. You need to toil and you need to labor and you need to, to, to work so that you can have what you need to live and to survive. Now I do realize, and this is where I got confused before, in Genesis chapter 3, that after the fall of man, after Adam and Eve willfully disobeyed God and ate of the tree that God told them not to, work became harder. It did become harder. And they had to work harder, and they had to labor more to have their needs met. But, but we dare not look at that and miss the fact that work was created by God. God gave them work to do, even in the perfect world that he had created. And I think that we need to be careful today, when we look at our work as a negative thing, as a bad thing, because God created us with the ability to work. And, and I believe that God created us with a need to work. And in some ways with a desire to work. And that is from God. It is not part of the curse. It is not a wicked thing. It is not a bad thing. It was what God created in his perfect world. That we might work and that we might labor for, for a variety of reasons. But it was given to us by God. God created work. And God, I believe, desires that we work. And, and as we do that, it, it is an opportunity to please God. As I thought about God creating work, I think, you know, work is also one of the ways in which God provides for our needs. Work is one of the ways that God provides for our needs. I mentioned it already, but I find it very interesting that God created everything that mankind needed in the Garden of Eden. Everything Adam and Eve needed to live and to be satisfied. But God did not tell Adam and Eve, sit back and just eat it and enjoy it. God said, no, 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 work for it. Toil, labor, till the ground. Work for it. God 
provided for their needs through their working, through their labors. Now, the rest of the scripture teaches that as well. Let me just read to you a couple of verses. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 11. Solomon says there, Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. What is, what is he saying in Proverbs? How does God provide for our needs? Through our work, through our labors. If somebody works their land, if somebody labors, they will have plenty. God will provide for their needs. We just studied here a little while ago the book of Ecclesiastes, and so you may remember this verse. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 5. It says, The fool folds his hand and eats his own flesh. What, what, what Solomon is saying there is the fool is lazy, and he dies from his own laziness. Because he's not laboring, he's not working. And God provides for our needs through our labors and through our work. Here's another verse that may be more familiar to many of you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Paul says, and here's a number of verses here, but Paul says, For you yourselves know how, we, how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anybody's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It is not because we do not have the right, but be but to, give you in, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this commandment. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some of you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busybodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. What is Paul saying Paul says, you know, we went in and we ministered and we served, but how were our needs provided for? Our needs were provided for because we worked. And he went on and he said a verse that many don't like to even hear today. He said, if you're not willing to work, then you shouldn't eat. Because that's how God provides for your needs. You know, probably one of the clearest uh, times that I saw the truth of that. Was I, and I've shared this before, was when I was in Bible college. And you've heard me share this example, I'm sure. But in Bible college, you know, money was always tight. And anybody that's ever been in college, you know, uh, things are tight. There's not a lot of money there. And, and, and as I was in college, uh, there, you know, little jobs, the opportunity to work was given many times. You know, painting jobs on the weekend, or working with this, and helping this person, and doing that, and, and I worked part-time in the mall as well as I did that. But I said, you know, as I was working and doing those things, God was providing the income that I needed. And, and I can never say that I had more than I needed, but I can't say that I was ever short of what I needed either, because God provided through work the opportunity to have my needs met. Well, there was another mentality that was in college when I was there as well. And I called it the pray and run to the mailbox mentality. You know, you prayed that the Lord would provide your needs, and then every day at mail time, you ran to the mailbox and hoped that somebody sent you a check. Well, it's interesting to me because, as I said already, my, I, I, never had, I never had access. But my needs were always met as I worked and as I did things. Those that prayed and ran to the mailbox, many of them never made it out of college because they never had money. And they never had their bills met because they were continually waiting for the, the money they needed literally to fall out of the sky. The same ones were saying, no, I can't paint this weekend because, uh, you know, I need to do something else. And I need to do this. And I'm not, gonna, I'm not willing to work and, and, and earn it. God's just going to provide it some other way. And I thought, you know, God provides through our work. God provides the needs that you and I have for food and to pay our bills and those things. As we are willing to step out and work, God provides for our needs. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to be insensitive to those that cannot work. The Bible is full of, of examples of God providing for those that did not have the ability to work. If you read through the Old Testament, it's full of God's people providing for those that physically were unable to provide for themselves. 
The New Testament is full of opportunities that God provided for those that could not provide for themselves. All kinds of examples of that. But even then, even for those that were not able to work and provide for themselves, what did God use to provide for their needs? Those that were working. And, and so work is an opportunity for God to provide for our needs. And even in the Garden of Eden, God provided for the needs of Adam and Eve as they worked, and as they toiled, and as they labored. Work is something that God created, something that God gave us. Work is something that God uses to provide for our needs. One more thing I want to look at this morning, and I really want to emphasize this this morning, and I at this point, I'm planning on having an entire message dedicated to this later on. But work is also work is also a God-given opportunity to influence and to reach our world for Christ. Work is an opportunity for us to influence and to reach our world for Christ. Billy Graham once said that the next great awakening in this country, he believed, would take place in the workplace. He believed that the next great awakening in this country would take place in the workplace. And, and I thought about that. I, you know, think about the majority of opportunities that you have to reach an unbelieving world with the love of Christ. Think about the opportunities that you have to reach people around you for Christ. Where do they happen at? Where do they happen? They happen at work. Why do they happen at work? Because at least a third of your day is spent there. And a third of your day or more is spent rubbing shoulders with those that are unbelievers in your workplace. I mentioned earlier, who knows you better than the people you work with? Very few people. Very few people know you better than the people that you work with every day. And who do they know? They don't know the person that people see in church on Sunday morning. They know who you are outside of that. And, and, and what better, what greater opportunity to reach our world for Christ than in the place that we work. I didn't go through and count these, and so I'm going to throw a statistic out that I didn't verify, but it makes sense to me. I was reading somebody this week that said, you know, in the book of Acts, there are 40 miracles recorded there. Guess how many of them took place directly or indirectly related to the work? 39 of them. 39 of them. So as the apostles and those in the book of Acts were, were getting out into their world and as they were impacting the world for Christ, where was it happening? It wasn't in the church and in the synagogue. It was in the workplace. It was in the place where, where people were spending the majority of their time. Now, I mixed up on some toes now. Got to do that to have a good message on Sunday morning, right? Got to step on a few toes. We as Christians today really have a warped idea of what it is to reach our world for Christ. We really do. We have the wrong idea of what it means to, to win our, our world to Christ. Our idea of winning our world to Christ is inviting people to come to us and hoping they catch Christianity Almost the way you catch the flu. You just happen to be in the right place and get breathed on by the right person and you might become a Christian. That's not how we are to win our world for Christ. That's not it at all. We have, and, and again, I'm not bad talking any of these things because I'm involved in many of these things and I think they all have their place. But, but somehow we have the idea that as Christians, we're going to win our world to Christ by inviting the kids to our Awana program. And we're going to win our world to Christ by inviting kids to VBS this week. And we're going to win our world to Christ by having men's fellowships and women's fellowships and special activities. And we're announcing to the world, you come to us. And we're going to share Christ with you. And the world is saying, I ain't coming to you. I'm not stepping into your church. I'm not coming to your activity. I know when I come there, you're going to beat me over the head with a message. And I said, you know, go back to the New Testament. Go back to the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. What is the first word of the Great Commission? Go. Go. It 
It's not come. It's go. And I thought, you know, we miss that. The Great Commission reaching our world for Christ is go into the world. If you go into the book of Acts, now I realize that you see big meetings in the book of Acts and, and, and people preaching, and, and I'm not taking away from the fact that, that people are saved that way. I'm not saying that, that, that they're bad things. But what I am saying is, you look through the book of Acts, what do you see? You see believers going into the world. And rubbing shoulders with unbelievers and, and, and living Christ and sharing the message of salvation. And, and you see people coming to Christ. And I thought, what greater opportunity do you and I have today to reach our world than through our workplace? What better opportunity do you have to shine as the light of Christ and to share Christ with an unbeliever than where you work? You will not have a better opportunity. If you're spending 90,000 hours of your life at work, what great opportunities God gives you to share your faith in Christ. What a great opportunity you have to go into your world and reach Christ. And I thought, you know, sharing Christ in our workplace doesn't necessarily mean walking in and beating people over the head with the Bible. It doesn't mean being a continual spouting verse of scripture. It doesn't mean a lot of the things that we seem to think it means. What does it mean? It means living Christ. Our life is about living for Christ. It's about the fact that I know God is my heavenly father. And I have a relationship with him through Christ. And my being a testimony and an example at work is simply living for Christ. Simply showing that I know Christ. Simply showing that he's an important part of my life. And then the scripture says, being ready and willing to give an answer to everyone who asks us the reason of the hope that is in us. Taking the opportunities to say, hey, the reason I'm doing the things I'm doing is because I know Christ. I shared this many times in the last however many years we've been here. But again, the first time that was ever really just made known to me. Annette and I were working at Sugarman's. And a uh, great place to work. It's not even there anymore. Probably we killed it. <laughs> but I remember, you know, I was in Bible school at the time. And, uh, of course, I worked with some other Bible school students. And I remember one of the young ladies that we worked with that didn't really know her that well, but we worked together. And, and I remember somebody that I went to Bible college with coming up to me and saying, you know, Larry, I've been trying to share Christ with this girl for, for a long time, and she won't listen. She had nothing to do with it. She, she just tuned me right out. And I don't know what I said at the time, but, you know, I took note of it and, and kind of pushed it aside. And what was it, a couple of weeks later? We were working one day, and this, this young lady came up to me one, one day at work, and she says, Larry, i got a question for you. I said, sure, go ahead. She says, why are you different than everybody else that works here? I don't understand it. Your attitude's different. Your work is different. Everything you do is different. Why is that? And I said, well, let me, let me tell you. I said, the reason that I am different is because I know Christ. And, and let me tell you the difference that Christ has made in my life. And then, then, let me tell you how you can know Christ. And I would love to tell you that, that you know, she, she prayed and received Christ. She did not. But I, I had, what, about a 40, 45 minute opportunity to stand and share Christ. Why? Because she saw something different in how I worked. She saw something different in my attitude. Something different in my actions. And it wasn't me. It was Christ working through me. And I thought, you know, God gives us work for a number of reasons. He gives us work to supply our needs. God could just drop what we need out of the sky. He, he could do that. And he's done that in the past. But that's not how he chooses to work on a day-to-day -day basis. God provides our needs through our work. God provides opportunities for us to influence our world through those that we rub shoulders with, God gives us opportunities. God asks us to live and to shine as the light that, that He has made us to be. And, and we're going we're to continue.
continue with some of these thoughts over the next several weeks, but I thought, you know what? If you want to have a different attitude at work, grab a hold of some of these truths that we just talked about. Grab a hold of these things. Grab a hold of the fact that your work is a gift that God gave you. Grab a hold of the fact that God is answering your prayer for the supply of your needs through your work. Grab a hold of the fact that work is a tremendous opportunity to shine as a light and to influence the community that you live in. And as we begin to grab a hold of some of these truths, our entire attitude is going to change. We're going to look at our work differently. And I believe that we're going to begin to see God use us to influence the world that we live in. Let's take a moment and bow for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for your word. Lord, I just thank you for what you do. Thank you for the work that you give us to do. Lord, all of us have different desires, likes, and dislikes. And Lord, all of those things play into the work that you give us to do. Lord, I thank you that you give us work to do. And Lord, you provide for our needs. You provide for uh, opportunities to share Christ. Lord, you, you use us in so many ways. And Lord, I pray that we would walk in obedience to you. And Lord, as we walk with you, as we live with you, as we allow you to influence our lives, I pray that you would influence the world around us as we go into our world and see Christ. We thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name.